Okay, so today I want to tell you a little story about angle of attack sensors um, and why they're important. Um, and it's part of my ongoing work in, uh, about understanding violence um, and understanding not just um, you know, what causes violence, who is violence, how violence can prevent it, but understanding violence in scare quotes, understanding the, the, the idea the word violence, what is called violence, what is not called violence, um, how does this idea circulate in everyday life and popular imagination, um, how does it change the way we think about things, how does it change the way we respond to things, um, and so one of the ways I'm proceeding with this work is by an analysis of exemplars, um, looking at uh, particular examples of things that are thought of as as, as being good examples of violence, but even more interestingly, thinking of things that are not thought of as violence, examining things that are that are not typically conceptualized um, as, as, as being examples of violence. Um, so what I want to do now really is, is focus uh, on a particular case study of two closely related mass killings in which 346 people died in two related incidents. Um, and what interests me about um, these, these, the, the killing of these 346 people is the fact that currently um, the, it's, it's, the details of who's responsible is, is completely documented um, and it's not really controversial and findings are, are, are quite robust and agreed upon. Um, but despite the large number of, of, of deaths, no one has been prosecuted and there's no sign that any prosecutions will take place. And that's the first starting point of interest. Um, and one of the things that's interesting um, to me is the kind of words, the, the language that, that, that assembles the concepts um, with which we think about these, these two mass killings. And one of the most interesting words here is this notion of an accident. Okay, and the word accident meaning precisely something that's no one's fault. Oh, sorry, it was an accident. Okay, the, it, I didn't mean to do that. Um, just, it just happened. Um, and and the, the notion of the accident is really fundamental to these killings. Um, and so I want to think about the kind of the construction of the accidental. Um, the idea that, that, that some things you know, that just happen even though no one really intends them and that no one is really responsible for those things when they happen. Okay, so what am I talking about? I'm talking about two very particular historical incidents that happened in the last few years, um, about five and a half months apart. Okay, F number one, on the 29th of October, 2018, um, Jakarta Airport in Indonesia, um, Lion Air Flight 610 takes off from the runway and a few minutes later crashes into the ground, killing the entire um, crew and passengers, 189 people die instantly on impact. Second incident, 10th of March 2019, which coincidentally is my birthday, um, uh, Addis Ababa, uh, Ethiopian Airlines flight ET302 leaves the runway. Um, once again, a few minutes later, the plane plunges into the ground, killing all passenger and crew, 157 people have died. Um, so what has been said about these two incidents? Firstly, the Lion Air incident, the first one that happened. Um, Here's something really interesting. When planes, when when passenger planes crash and kill everyone, this is headline stuff. This, I mean, there's no, there's there are few things the media can love as much as a as an air traffic catastrophe of this kind. Um, it, it 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 really sort of sends fear into their audiences, creates a kind of a panic. Even though air tra air travel is is the safest form of travel, um, it 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 plays into a kind of a deep cultural anxiety. Um, and, and, and this is just, this is just great stuff, I mean, for, for the media to make money out of. But it, what's interesting about the Lion Air thing is you probably never heard of it. Um, it was a tiny little blip on the global media radar and it disappeared very quickly. Perhaps then the reason it disappeared is because it was explained very quickly and very effectively in a certain way. And, and the dominant explanation that went out with the news of the Lion Air um, uh, crash was this idea of the 
budget third world airline, which just didn't really have very good safety standards. So in that sense, the Lion Air um, crash could be understood uh, very quickly and very easily as a, 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 a typical feature of its, of its situation, that the people traveling on that plane were kind of local Indonesians of very little interest to the Western press. Um, if, the, if, if the West knew anything about um, budget airlines in Indonesia, it's probably the assumption that they're pretty dodgy. Um, evidence was um, put forward that this airline had a, had a pretty patchy safety record. Um, their pilots weren't very well trained. Um, and so the, uh, so, so, so the airline, the Lion Air crash kind of made sense immediately. It was, it was wrapped up in an intelligibility that like the lesson of, of, of from, from Lion Air um, 610 was not um, air travel is potentially terrifying. It's that um, if you happen to find yourself in the third world, choose a Western brand name airline. Don't go with the local dodgy stuff. You know it'll end badly. Okay, so there's a there's there's a kind of a a um, a, a, a post-colonial narrative that wraps up this uh, this this disaster and kind of makes it evaporate almost instantly. Several months later, 10th of March, 2019, Ethiopian Air leaving um, uh, Addis Ababa. Um, once again, uh, what, the, what the airline industry uh, likes to refer to, and, and we must watch these technical words, they're very important, likes to refer to as a hull loss, okay? Uh, the hull loss, that's, a, that's such a lovely turn of phrase. It's so, it's so bland and technical. Um, it refers to when a plane crashes so badly that it is destroyed and everyone on board dies. Um, so uh, Ethiopian Air suffers a hull loss, um, also shortly after takeoff. Um, and this, similar to Lion Air, this incident is just about to disappear off the radar. Um, except for one thing, amongst the passengers are a whole lot of United Nations staff on their way to a United Nations meeting. And this suddenly changes everything because rather than um, anonymous black faces disappearing into a void, we have people who are important uh, to Western press, people who are part of an internationalism. Um, and suddenly the, the presence of these UN passengers elevates the Ethiopian air crash into um, something of a media event. And it starts, um, it, it starts being widely reported. But while these things are being reported, while, they, while Ethiopian air ET302 is, is, is being covered as a kind of a, a human disaster, there's really no suspicion of malice. And this is in strong contrast to two preceding uh, hull losses. Uh, German Wings 1525, which had happened uh, just a few years before, where this um, once uh, budget European airline in this case, um, crashes into a mountainside in Europe. And it turns out that the pilot deliberately crashed the plane. Um, planes are so safe now. Technically, they are so incredibly safe that, it, that they tend not to crash unless they cr are crashed deliberately. Um, and here we see the classic example of a, a pilot with um, a, a history of serious psychological um, issues, um, deliberately um, plans to and then does crash the plane, killing everyone. Um, uh, and this is once again, this is wrapped up in the narrative of this, this uh, psychologically disturbed pilot. Um, at this, uh, also preceding this, we have the, the massive media spectacle. I mean, just contrast the, the level of media spectacle around Malaysian 370. The plane that just disappeared. I mean, this is, uh, and, and this is kind of astonishing. This is like a massive passenger plane on an international flight just goes missing, literally goes off the radar and is never found. There's a massive international search which is conducted for years um, and the plane is never found. And this is kind of mystery, like what happened to Malaysian 370? You can't lose a Boeing. 
Um, and so this is a, a matter, matter of huge investigation and speculation, detailed investigation into the the um, the, the histories of the, the of the pilots, um, attempts to track the plane in various ways after it, it disappears off radar. Um, uh, technical information about how long the engines would be able to run, which direction it had turned in, huge investigation around Malaysian 370. Um, and both of these um, strong suspicion that of, 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 of bad actors involved. Uh, uh, suicidal, homicidal German wings pilot, um, a, a pilot of unknown motivation in the, in the Malaysian case. Um, but but with Lion Air and Ethiopian Airlines, there's none of this talk. There's no talk that, that these planes were crashed. They just, it was literally an accident. These are, these are accidental air disasters. Um, no one is to blame. Okay, now, this is where it gets really interesting. Um, both planes crashed under almost identical circumstances. And these are the circumstances. The plane takes off from the runway, uh, picks up a lot of speed, uh, which is essential for planes to be able to lift off. They have to be going at a critical speed. Takes off, starting that smooth ascent um, towards its uh, tra uh, traveling altitude. Within minutes of leaving the runway, the plane suddenly starts plunging towards the ground, then goes up into the air, then goes towards the ground. So you have this kind of hellish roller coaster happening. The plane zigzagging in altitude, um, pulling up, falling down, pulling up, falling down, um, until eventually it smashes against the ground, killing everyone on board and being totally destroyed. And the interesting thing is this is exactly what happened to both planes at about the same time. The other thing that's equally interesting is that both planes were the new Boeing 737 MAX 8 model. And this becomes significant, okay? So what you have is the existing narrative that was fed to the press with the help of the Boeing Corporation the, the narrative of dodgy third world safety standards of Ethiopian and Indonesian um, uh, incompetence, poorly trained pilots, badly maintained planes. This version suddenly starts getting weaker and weaker. Um, they attempt to, to, to sort of insert in here um, a, a story that, that the pilots in both these um, airlines were poorly trained and to explain the, the catastrophes in that way. But it's, it, this, 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 this explanation starts not keeping the kind of momentum that it had before. And one of the things that starts disrupting that momentum is that a whole range of whistleblowers suddenly step in. Um, and, and, a, and a range of pilots, engineers, former employees of the airline regulators suddenly start giving information to the press. The, uh, just one or two press agencies start doing a more thorough investigation um, and eventually an inquiry is established. Um, so what do, we, what do we understand about what really happened here? Let's look at the at at, at the, the the kind of socio-economic and technical conditions of possibility of these two accidents, and of course the word accident really being put in the strongest possible inverted commas um, at this point. Um, okay, uh, airline passenger travel. It's a two horse race. And the two horses in this race are Boeing and Airbus. Boeing, the big American um, company and Airbus, the big French company. These are the people who build and sell passenger planes. Um, they, they, they totally dominate the global market. But around 2018, um, Airbus had taken a substantial lead in this plane in this race. And the, and, and the reason for this lead is that their engines were better. 
they, they were putting much more fuel efficient engines on their planes. And this is the thing you've got to understand. When you buy a ticket for a flight, essentially a lot of the cost of that ticket is to the, uh, the aviation fuel. Planes burn an incredible amount of, uh, of fuel and it's a, it's a major travel expense. Um, so having more fuel efficient engines is a game changer. It means airlines can take people places cheaper. And as a result, the, the more fuel efficient Airbus engines uh, are much more attractive to airlines buying new planes and Boeing is, is at risk of dramatically losing orders. In fact, Boeing are, are, are at risk of kind of dropping out of the, the, the airline market as a serious competitor for a decade because of how um, behind their um, technology is. Um, so of course, Boeing need to up their game. They need to they need to get out newer, better, more fuel efficient planes. But the trouble is that um, designing a a, a a a passenger plane is an incredibly expensive and time consuming um, business. I mean, this literally it's that we're running into hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And, and it can take a decade from drawing board design to uh, airline regulator approval. Um, and so, so the, the Boeing simply can't face this prospect of being knocked out of the market for a decade. Um, so what are they going to do? And they come up with a um, brilliant solution. They, they, can, they can buy new engines. Um, they don't have to make their own engines. They can, they can buy these fuel efficient engines and, and here's the stroke of genius, they can put them on the existing planes. Um, so literally what a Boeing 737 MAX 8 is, is it's the, the old Boeing 737 that has been around for decades, really one of the most common um, planes, you know, going back to the 19, 1970s, 1980s in its original iteration, just one of the best known planes in the industry. And they can, they can stick, the, stick the new engines on and it can be more fuel efficient. But there's a problem. And the problem is literally that the engines don't fit on the plane. Um, it's got to do, with, you know, the engine is cylindrical. And the old Boeing 737s, you look at the, the old models, the, the, you, the engine looks like a cigar. It has quite a narrow bore. Um, the diameter is, is, is quite small and the engine is quite long. The new, more fuel efficient engines are much wider. The, the, the diameter of that engine intake is much, much bigger. Um, and literally it can't fit under the wing. There isn't enough space between the bottom of the wing and the ground to run that thing along the runway. Um, the, 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 the engine diameter, which is necessary for its efficiency, just doesn't allow for that. So here's the problem that they, they can get the new engines, they can stick them on the old planes, but they don't fit. So they think about this and they're like, they work out a way to make them fit. And they literally just shift the engines forward. So rather than the engine being kind of directly under the wing, the engine is that sort of pushed forward, so it's sort of coming a little bit up from um, the the wing. Um, but this creates another problem. Okay, it creates a fundamental problem that the the plane behaves badly because the engines are in the wrong place. Um, and I need to go into a certain amount of technical detail here to explain this. Um, but when they, find, when they work out that they can stick the engine on, but kind of in the wrong place, but it kind of makes the plane do the wrong thing, but they can fix the wrong thing that the plane is doing. Um, they can add on another control system that counters the, 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 the fact that, that, that the, the plane is kind of, is, is a bit iffy. Um, and here we need to understand the question of, angle of attack sensors. And here I need to go on to a little bit of a detail, if you'll bear with me, on why planes fly. It's a really interesting question, like what, how do hundreds of tons of steel stay airborne? Um, and, and to understand this problem, you need to understand that. Well, planes 
planes fly because um, they are moving at a critical speed, which forces the air down under the wing and and pushes the wing upwards. So, and, and the critical thing here is the speed, okay? Planes can't fly slowly. Um, passenger planes, Boeings, Airbuses, they can't fly slowly. Um, if their speed drops be below a critical um, level, they, they fall down. They, then they just become chunks of steel falling because of gravity and crashing into the ground. So the, the, the speed at which a plane moves, this, and, and, and the way in which that, that, that speed goes through there, curves under the wing, pushes down, pushing the wing up, lifting the plane. This is absolutely critical to understanding um, why, why planes stay up. They stay up because they are moving fast and they're pushing air down, not, not, not just because they're going forwards, they're actually they're creating a, a downward force. And, and you can always see that the, the, the wings are curved in a particular way because of that. Um, so, so now here's the problem. Um, when, when you want to go up in a plane, okay, we want to take off on the runway, you want to, you want to, you, you, you want to increase the altitude, you want to, you, you want to go higher and higher in the plane. You're not only using the force of the engines to go forwards, you're using the force of the engines to go upwards. So when planes are going upwards, um, they're losing uh, forward speed very badly, partly because there's more wind resistance because of that angle. You know, that, that angle doesn't have much wind resistance. This has really a lot, but they're also slowing down because the thrust is going up instead of forward. And this is why takeoff is so so weird in a plane. There's a particular way like the, when the plane is like thundering down the runway and starting to shake a little bit, and then it takes off and it, because they need maximum energy for that lift. Um, and, 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 so, and, and here's the essential, the technical problem of, 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 of planes is how can you get enough energy to go upwards without slowing the plane down too much, because if you slow it down too much, it will fall like a stone, okay? And this, and, 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 and this is a real problem with flying. And this is what happened um, in that um, Air France flight from, uh, was it from New York to Paris, uh, about a decade or so ago. Anyway, that's another story I won't bore you with. Okay, so, you. You need lots of force for to go up and forward. It's easy to go forward. It's hard to go up and forward. Um, so what the, the great danger when you are trying to go up and forward at the same time is that the plane will slow down, and it will and 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 it will slow down below its what is called the stall speed, the speed at which it can't actually stay flying anymore. And when it gets to the stall speed it will fall down and crash. Okay, Th this is the problem. How do, you, how do you go up and maintain a fast enough forward speed so that you don't stall and you don't crash? Um, and and, and this, is the, this, is the big, this is the this is the first issue of flying a plane is how not to stall it when, you, when, you, when, you when you're also trying to go upwards. Um, now, here's the problem. Um, with these new Boeing 737 MAX 8. Because of the position of the engines, as it starts accelerating, as it starts going forward, the nose starts tilting up. Uh, uh, up. Okay, so as it starts increasing in speed, it also starts changing its angle. Now, the first principle of airworthiness of a, of a plane, roadworthiness of a car, is that it only does what you tell it to do. I mean, this, this is almost like a defining rule of roadworthiness or airworthiness. The vehicle must do what the driver tells it to do. So for instance, a car, if you hit the brakes and the car veers to the left every time, that is not a roadworthy car. That is, that is a car that in an accident will crash, okay? Similarly, if you try and do one thing with a plane, and it does that thing, but also does another thing. That plane is not airworthy. So if you accelerate in a plane, and when you accelerate, it tilts the nose up, that plane is not an airworthy plane. That is a dangerous plane. 
Um, and this is what the Boeing 37 MAX 8 does. It, um, when, when you accelerate, it lifts the nose. The, uh, and because it lifts the nose, it starts slowing the plane down. Okay, this is a problem. So they know, oh shit, our engines do this. Like when, when, the, when, the, when the plane starts accelerating, it, st it starts tilting upwards, it starts slowing down. Whoa, what are we gonna do? We'll build in an override mechanism. Okay, and this is where you need to look at the, the, the slide on MCAS, on the Maneuvering Characteristic and Augmentation System, um, MCAS. Okay, they introduced a, an, a, a control system outside the pilot's control called MCAS. And essentially what MCAS does is it, 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 it checks whether the plane is starting to, to nose up and it tilts the nose back down. So it's a brilliant solution, okay? So the pilot's like trying to go forward, the plane's like tilting upwards. MCAS says, whoa, whoa, you're tilting upwards, straighten out. And so everything's great. Uh, per perfect solution to the problem. The design fault in the plane is corrected by a, a, um, by a override system that is outside the pilot's control. And this is where the uh, angle of attack sensor is a really important thing. Now, uh, you, you, you've probably seen an angle of attack sensor, but you, don't, you didn't know what it was. It's a little thing on the front of the plane below the windows of the, of the cockpit. It's just like this little sort of strip of, looks like an aerial or something. Um, and what that thing does is it just, it's just a sensor to say, what angle is this plane flying at? Is it flying flat? Is it going down? Is it going upwards? And so the angle of attack sensor tells the pilot, well, you, you're heading upwards or no, you're cruising nicely uh, at an even altitude, okay? V very simple, very, very critically important um, piece of technology, angle of attack sensor, because if the pilot doesn't know the angle of attack, that uh, something can go wrong. And the thing that can go wrong is the plane can be tilting up too much. Because it's tilting up too much, it can be slowing down. Uh, the pilot tries to speed it up, but it, the, the engines are not powerful enough to speed it up at that tilt level. It falls to the ground, crashes, potentially destroying the plane, potentially killing crew and passengers. Okay, so the angle of attack sensors is absolutely critical piece of information for the pilots. Um, and the, and it's an absolutely critical um, piece of information for this MCAS system. The MCAS system, which says, oops, engines are pulling the plane upward by accident because it's a shift design, um, better tilt it down again. And then the, the kind of computer system says, um, we're tilting up, let's flatten out. Okay. And, 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 and this, this information doesn't go through the pilot. This is automated information. Okay. And this is, and, and so here, the, 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 the angle of attack system feeding information into the, the system that then automatically straightens the plane out. Everything depends depends on that. Okay, now let's just flip back to the world in which this is happening. Okay, so Boeing, Boeing have come up with this brilliant idea. We'll stick the new engines on the plane. Whoops, engines do this weird thing. Okay, we'll put the override system in to kind of fix the weird thing the engines are doing um, and, 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 and we'll get people to buy it. And this is the critical thing is that, and we'll get people to buy it now. So the plane has to go through the regulators and the, the regulators, the FAA, various international regulators um, have to, to look at the plane and, and do a detailed analysis of whether this is actually a safe play, plane that they can approve, okay? So when you design and release a new plane, it goes through a massive kind of uh, approval system. But when you release an update to an old plane, it doesn't. So if you can sell this new plane and say, this is just your regular 737 that we've been flying for 50 years already, it's just the max eight revision, okay? It can sweep through the regulators very easily. And that's exactly what they did. Not only did they do that, they limited the information that was provided to regulators and they limited the information that was provided to pilots. So they didn't really let on 
that there was kind of a bit of a background problem that they'd had to fix up. Um, uh, and and they just didn't provide this information that this was a this this plane was actually fundamentally different because its behavior while flying was fundamentally different to all previous Boeings. They just didn't tell the regulators that, and they just didn't tell the pilots that. They then also said, um, "Well, we've got to make this plane cheap so that we can undercut Airbus. So let's leave out everything we can, just strip it down and make it cheap." And so they stripped out two things. The one thing they um, they, they 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 changed is that the this override system that says, "Oops, if the plane's tilting upwards, flatten it out." Um, they only attach that to one angle of attack sensor. And there's an angle of attack sensor on both sides of the plane. And this is absolutely crucial because the principle of safe air travel is a principle of redundancy. That's why planes don't crash. Because if something stops working, there's another thing that takes over. This is, this is a principle of redundancy. Um, that everything, if something breaks, there's already a built-in backup to take over. And that's why planes don't crash. But, and that's why you have two angle of attack sensors. If the one starts malfunctioning, the pilot is like, whoa, whoa, we're getting different readings from the different angle of attack sensors. What's going on? They only attached the MCAS system to one sensor because it was cheaper and less complicated to do it that way. Okay, so, um, so, so this entire system depends on a single uh, sensor that has no fail safe backup. They also then did an astonishing thing. And they said, look, we can have an emergency override system that you hit a button and it de deactivates the MCAS if things get weird, but it's not a standard feature. If you want that, you've got to buy the more expensive version of the plane. Um, so they left it out. They only attached one angle of attack sensor. They left out the emergency override uh, and made it a expensive optional extra. And then they also said, and look, you don't really need to re retrain your pilots because that's really expensive. Taking your pilots out of flying time, sending them into, into um, training, um, wasting all that time and money. Um, so what we'll do is we will just give you a little iPad app, 30 minute iPad app to, to get the pilots up to speed. Um, and they did all of this because paperwork training and safety technology are expensive and they needed to be cheap because they needed to com compete with Airbus. Okay, so you think there's a lot of technical stuff going on there. There's a whole nother level. What's happening in the world at this point? Like what, 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 what kind of, 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 of global economic system are we working in? Uh, at, at this time, 2017, 2018, 2019. Um, well, one of the things that's been going on is several decades of neoliberalism, okay, which is basically the government's decided that um, they shouldn't be spending money on a whole lot of unnecessary stuff. This kind of, this big uh, argument against big government, cut the red tape, um, stop spending money on government, uh, let, let, um, let, let, let business flourish. That is the job of government is to, to encourage business to flourish, not to, not to have huge systems of, of, of laws and regulation um, that stop private enterprise really getting on with their business. Um, so essentially what this meant is the FAA, the Federal Aviation Authority in the United States, the primary regulator for actually the world, in a, not just the US, um, got right-sized. They got their budget slashed, they got their staff slashed um, as part of, the, of this kind of uh, small government cut the red tape um, um, logic. And, and the second step of that logic is that markets can re regulate themselves. And a good economy uh, markets, you know, business, can regulate itself if needs to, it's in its own interest to regulate itself. So what they did, because the FAA didn't, couldn't afford um, technical staff, they, they told the, the, the plane companies to do their own safety checks. And they created an astonishing system where they actually allowed the staff of Boeing 
to sign off on the safety regulations of their own planes without external so oversight. And they're like, well, no, those guys know what they're doing. Um, we'll, we'll leave it to them. So, so deregulation, cut the FAA, handed back the power to self-regulate to the companies building the planes rather than an external responsible agency. And within the companies, of course, something really interesting had happened that Boeing and, and had evolved from being a kind of a geek company, like an, 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 a bunch of engineers being really interested in building stuff to a massive global corporation, one of the wealthiest corporations in the world. And of course, part of that is that it was run now by business managers, not by engineers. And so decisions of what to sign off on and what not to sign off on were fundamentally done by by, by um, business people, not by technical people. And the business managers made the company decisions, set the deadlines, put pressure on the employees and the companies. Um, and of course, this meant that individual engineers, even if they weren't happy with the timelines, with the safety systems, they, 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 had a, they basically had the choice to shut up or get fired. Um, and, um, and, and, and so they were trapped because, you know, there's, there's just not a lot of other places they could get, go and work in that industry, um, given that, these, the, the, that Boeing really dominate the US airline industry. Um, and the other thing that happened at the same time as part of this system of, 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 of deregulation is that the reports from pilots on, um, on incidents, flying incidents, were kept anonymous and confidential. Um, so all of these things, the, 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 the underfunding of the FD, uh, FAA, allowing the, the companies producing the planes to sign off on their own safety checks, um, the company being run primarily purely in terms of the economics rather than the, the, the engineering technicalities, um, the compromised positions of, a, of, of, of the technical staff themselves and the, the disappearance into the void of pilot reports uh, that, that couldn't be then scrutinized by the public. So here we have, I think, what can be really accurately described in the technical phrase, a recipe for disaster. Okay, the first thing is the Boeing 737 MAX 8 was not airworthy. Okay, we've said before, airworthiness means, first of all, that the plane does what the pilot tells it to do and not something else. And secondly, that there is a comprehensive system of fail safes. Um, if something goes wrong, something breaks, something else takes over. The Boeing 737 MAX 8 did not fulfill the, 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 the most basic founding principles of airworthiness, mm -hmm. i.e. it is a plane that should not have passed regulator approval and not been allowed to fly. What, what was already known? This angle of attack sensor thing, the thing that tells you, is the plane going up or is it going flat? Um, that they only attached one angle of attack sensor to the MCAS system. It, there were 200 known previous failures of the angle of attack sensors in previous models. This was a known device with questionable reliability, okay? Secondly, what else was known? Multiple anonymous pilot report on the Boeing 737 MAX 8 had reported the plane going into, and once again, one of these lovely technical phrases, uncontrolled descent, okay? The plane going down by itself in a way that the pilots couldn't do anything about. Um, so these two things, angle of attack sensors known to fail, planes are known to just start pointing their nose towards the ground and disobeying the pilot's instruction. Um, now, when one looks at the story, when one looks at what actually happened with Lion Air 610 and Ethiopian Air E310, it's very clear this specific thing happens. The plane takes off. It's going up very nicely. Suddenly, it turns itself down towards the ground. The pilots 
pull it back up, it turns itself down again. And so there's this hellish tug of war happening where the terrified pilots are desperately trying to pull the nose up. And the MCAS system is overriding them and turning the nose down because the MCAS system is misreading the angle of attack because it is because because the, the, it's getting a faulty reading from the angle of attack sensor. So the pilots are, are fighting with all their might to lift the nose up, keep the plane flying. The MCAS system, which stupidly has misread the, the angle of the plane, thinks the plane is tilting upwards, where in fact it's tilting downwards, and overrides the pilot and points the plane directly um, towards the ground. Okay, and it's very obvious that what happened with Lion Air 610 is not that the dodgy third world airline wasn't keeping up pilot training and safety checks. What happened is that the MCAS system crashed the plane. The MCAS system took control out of the hands of the pilots and crashed the plane into the ground. Okay, um, here it's really significant then that Boeing basically lied to the regulators and lied to the pilots. It gave them incorrect information about the nature and power of the MCAS system. Um, it did not give them sufficient information about the conditions under which it could kick in, nor did it give them comprehensive training about what to do when that system kicked in of how to deactivate the system. And remember, they made the emergency override, whoops, an optional uh, expensive extra. And that the pilots only had a 30 minute iPad app training them to deal with this plane that under critical conditions behaves totally differently from, from every other Boeing they have ever flown. Um, so this is a very, very serious problem here, okay, that, that Boeing lied, that Boeing signed off on a plane that they knew was not airworthy, that it was not airworthy for two different reasons, that they misinformed the regulators and they misinformed the pilots, and most of all, they did not tell the pilots what to do in this crisis situation where the MCAS system was turning the plane's nose to the ground. The pilots had no idea what was happening and what to do about it um, in that critical situation. Literally, the plane went out of the, 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 the pilot's hands it, and flew itself into the ground. Um, so let's think about that for a second. 346 people were killed. What kind of violence is that? Well, it's an accident. These are accidents. That, that, this is exactly the word that I'm interested in. These were accidents. No one meant for those planes to crash. No one meant for those 346 people to die. Um, no one intended to commit murder, certainly. But what, what can we say then? Well, the first thing I want to say is that there's a very clear pattern of the creation of risk from which large scale deaths were an absolutely reasonable prediction. That while no one intended to commit murder, it was clear that a situation was being created in which people would be killed. Um, and what, the other thing that's so clear is that that didn't happen because of um, an oversight. It wasn't a slip, it wasn't a mistake. It wasn't like, oops, no one noticed this. It happened because the normal demands of government, of, of, of this kind of neoliberal small government cost-cutting deregulation, the normal demands of commerce that the responsibility of companies is to their shareholders. Um, the responsibility of Boeing, of the business managers running Boeing is to the profits of their shareholders, not to the integrity of their engineers and not to the, the, the well-being of, the, of the, um, the public flying in their planes. All of this is, 
is, is, is, is, is, is, seems to be absolutely central to understanding these so-called accidents and why I find the term accident so wildly inappropriate in this case, because there, was, there were no accidents here. What there were were the outcomes of decisions that were made to prioritize profit over risk. That is, that is what happened here. Um, the other thing that happened here that is so interesting to me is where these plane crashes happened. Um, it's hard to prove this, but it would seem to be unimaginable that the first Boeing 37, 737 MAX 8 crash could have happened in a Western country, could have happened in New York or London, could have happened out of JFK or Heathrow without the world stopping, without there being such a massive investigation into how the entire passenger and crew of a leading Western airline ended up dying shortly after takeoff, that there would have been no second accident. There would have been an immediate, thorough, compelling uh, investigation. While that investigation was taking place, all other Boeing 737 MAX 8 would have been grounded instantly. Um, it, 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 it would have just been intolerable that there was, there was strong evidence indicating um, the, uh, the basic uh, um, unairworthiness of the plane and, a, and what really amounts to systematic corporate corruption behind that. Um, but because it happened in Ethiopia, because these were faceless, anonymous citizens of countries that, are, that do not appear on the Western radar, because the narrative of third world incompetence could account um, for what had happened, the second plane was allowed to do the same thing. And, it, and, and, it, and they very nearly got away with the second crash using the same cover story, using the same narrative of the accident and whose incompetence was behind the accident. And it was only really the presence of, these, the, of the United Nations staff that escalated this thing. And it was only at that point that, that insiders started leaking information. And pilots started saying, yeah, we, we know what this plane does. We've had this thing happen to us. That engineer started saying, yep, yeah, look, this design was, was, was not okay. Um, that all of this started coming out. And so when we look at these things, these, these, these events are outcomes of, of very comprehensible, inexorable social processes, okay? that the Boeing killings resulted from, the, from multiple instances of a decentralized application of standard practices of neoliberal late capitalism. They were an inevitable outcome of deregulation of, of, um, of the of systems of, of social protection. They were an inevitable outcome of the corporate shift to short-term financial planning and economic react, rationalization, that the, that, that the people earning the millions at Boeing have to show quarterly results, um, have to show how they are cutting costs, have to show how they're making a cheaper product and selling it faster. Um, the, 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 the systematic handing over um, of these decisions about planes to business managers, uh, removing them from the hands of technical experts, and by a number of means silencing those te technical experts, both by removing their authority um, to raise objections, but also jeopardizing their careers if they do um, uh, raise objections. All of these are intrinsic parts of the of, 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 of the social system that produces these effects. And here is where I want to reflect on our theory of violence and to say, what, what kind of violence is this? What kind of violence is these 346 people being killed? Um, it's not the kind of violence we, this is not a serial killer. This is not a street criminal. It's another kind of violence. And, 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 and the kind of violence it is has, has, has been well articulated, and although it hasn't really filtered through into the criminal justice system or into the popular imagine, 
nation. It's been well theorized by people who think about this thing. Um, and Galton, 50 years ago already, has articulated the notion of structural violence, which is to, a, a way of talking about the way in which social systems are organized in a way that harms people, in a way that puts people at risk, um, increases their risk of injury and death, uh, deprives them of the, the, the essentials of their well-being. And structural violence does not require the malicious intention from anyone. It doesn't require a bad guy trying to do bad things. It doesn't require acts of physical aggression by the people who are responsible. It rests on completely different um, uh, kind of systems of, of causation. Um, firstly, it risks. It, it works on the normalization um, of, of risks. It works on on making a social system in which certain risks are are just made to be inevitable, um, and it and it rests on the mystification of those risks. It, it it risks. It works on either explicitly lying to people about certain dangers or much more commonly, simply withholding the information, simply not giving enough people the information they need to understand what is dangerous in their world. It also rests on something else very important. And this is why the location of these killings is so important. It rests on the differential valuing of human life. It rests on the fact that some human lives are seen as important and others are seen as not important. So the luxurious lives of the corporate managers of the Boeing Corporation are more important than the deaths of people in Indonesia and Ethiopia within that system. Um, and so the system is designed to suit um, the political elites that, um, that get into power by offering to cut the red tape um, and cut, cut the size of government um, because that's what they have to do to cut taxes and that's what voters want. Okay, so this, so this kind of system of political interest that starts with no new taxes and ends up with an eviscerated regulator that, that puts people's lives in danger, that, 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 that logic is inexorable. That logic proceeds um, without it needing any bad guy. Um, without it needing any malicious intent. Okay, so what we really need to be doing here is looking at the entire social system, not just the system of Indonesia, not just the, the country of Ethiopia. We need to look at the global political and economic system in which some planes crash and others don't. Um, the global economic system in which decisions are, are taken to put, to create certain risks because it's worth it. And the worth it specifically means the profit margins of the major political players, the, the major um, economic muscle men um, within Western economies. Um, so when one talks about the killing of the 346 people, one needs to talk about the corporate management of Boeing. One needs to talk about the, the political ruling class of the United States um, and, the, the, and the changes they've made to government and regulation. Um, and one needs to understand all of those, but we need to understand more. So here, I'm, just going, I'm going to go on another tangent. Boeing, what is Boeing? It's a corporation. It's a very, very wealthy and powerful corporation. Um, it's incidental that they make passenger planes and that when you think of Boeing, you think of passenger planes. Boeing is something else. They are the second biggest arms manufacturer on the planet. Now, weapons are one of the biggest and most profitable industries. Uh, you know, they're really big industries, oil, weapons. Uh, these, are, these are the big global um, profiteering systems. And Boeing, Boeing is literally the second biggest um, um, producer of um, machinery of mass destruction in the entire world. And that's a legal business that is normalized. That is, that is just seen as an important part of the US economy, a vital part of the, the US economy. 
And the main customers that Boeing sells to are the USA and a range of countries in the Middle East. Um, and when one looks at who they're selling to, it becomes very, very clear that the people they're selling to are involved with these wars of um, international aggression. I mean, the, the countries that have illegally entered and overthrown um, uh, other governments, the US invading Afghanistan, um, Iraq, um, and also um, destabilizing other regions like, like Syria, like Yemen. I mean, these, 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 these disasters, these um, human catastrophes of war um, are, are also intrinsically linked to, um, into the manufacture and sale of weapons. Um, and, you know, the, that, that, that we, we, the, the, this is not a new idea, the idea of a military industrial complex being a really, really powerful part of the United States politics and economy. Um, that, that the sale of weapons is absolutely critical to the, um, the lifestyles of citizens in those countries because they're absolutely critical to the economies of those countries. Um, what this means then is that Boeing is literally in the business of killing, that that's what they are. They're, they're, they're a company that makes machines to kill people, which is a very different way of thinking of them to being a company that um, transports people from A to B in, in a weird kind of uncomfortable luxury that, that is made to feel like they, you know, that they're sitting in an armchair at home, but is actually just horrible also at the same time. So Boeing are, they're, 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 they're in the business of killing. That's what they do. They're, they're a company are, that, that makes stuff to kill other people. Um, which is hugely, hugely problematic. Um, but there's nothing wrong with it in the sense of the law. There's no, there, there, that there's nothing saying, well, that, that people shouldn't make money out of making machines to kill other people. That is, that is seen as okay within the kind of norms of capitalism. Occasionally, there's some little like sort of fringe regulation, or we don't like that country's government, so let's not sell to them. But mostly, you know, go ahead, make, make the stuff, sell it. Um, this also means that when you contribute to Boeing, i.e. when you buy a plane ticket for a flight um, on an airline that is flying Boeings, that you're contributing to economically, you're, you're giving money through your ticket, through your airline company, to the Boeing Corporation, that you are supporting a, an, 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 a, the global industry of mass murder. And this is not something we normally think about. We don't normally think like, oh, I need to, I need to get there quickly, let me buy a plane ticket. We don't normally think like, oh, what I'm doing when I do this is um, giving a part of this money to the company that is, um, that, that is intrinsic to the killing of vulnerable people across the world. But we do need to think about that. We need, we, this, this is exactly the kind of theory of violence I'm proposing here, that we do need to think about what it means to, 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 to participate even simply as an as a airline passenger in this military industrial complex, in this system um, of destruction. But it doesn't stop there. Let me raise a final incident before we wrap up this long, long story. Five days after the Ethiopia air killings, Mozambique, on the east coast of Africa, a little further down, was hit by the worst cyclone in recorded history. So 15th of March. The cyclone hit the coast of Mozambique immediately killed a hundred people and displaced a hundred thousand more. Now to say a hundred thousand people would be displaced doesn't quite get at the way in which these people's lives were destroyed, their homes were destroyed, the social infrastructure was destroyed, the clinics they could have gone to, um, the logistical systems that they could have got them food and medicine to keep them alive in the wake of this destruction, those were annihilated. 
So 100 people were immediately killed in the brute force of the cyclone and 100,000 were placed at massive risk in a country defined by poverty, malaria, uh, a whole lot of other risks that, that, that to, to, to damage the infrastructure of a, of, of, a, of a country like this is to put a lot of people in, in extreme precarity and immediate danger for their lives, okay? And this, this cyclone, Cyclone Ida, um, is, 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 it was, was also not an accident. It was not just a chaotic um, uh, weather event. It was also a predictable outcome of a predictable system. And the predictable system that it is an outcome of is the system of, of climate change, the, the, the system of global warming produced by certain human technologies. And the fact that that global warming has a much, much more serious, a much more catastrophic, much more deadly impact on vulnerable people in developing countries. It's certainly there are fires in Australia and California. Certainly these are visible uh, disasters, but the impact um, on, on vulnerable people in developing countries is, is exponentially more serious. Um, and that this, once again, is these are not accidents. This is a system that can be understood and a system that, that, that can be either maintained or dismantled. So what's, what's Cyclone Ida got to do with, with angle of attack sensors and you? Here's an interesting statistic. One international plane trip contributes on average, more than the carbon emissions of the average African person in a year. Like one person hopping on a plane, flying to a different country, produce, it results in more climate change um, producing carbon emissions than the entire life for one year of the average person living in Africa, okay? I said before that, that one of the reasons this whole thing happened, one of the reasons Boeing played Russian roulette with the 737 was because they wanted more fuel efficient engines because the one thing about airplanes is they burn a lot of fuel. Airlines are one of the major producers of, uh, the major consumers um, of, 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 of fossil fuels and and the normalized system of international flights is, um, is a major contributor towards carbon emissions. And what's interesting uh, is, is thinking about the second most, the second most um, um, profitable route in the world, the most profitable, you can guess, uh, New York to London and back again. That, 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 that's where, that, that's the, the, really the big problem. You know, Heathrow, JFK, second most profitable route in the world, Sydney to Melbourne. Australians like to fly. They fly a lot. Um, Sydney to Melbourne um, is one of the big competitors to in 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 the airline system, in the system of of burning fossil fuels, contributing to global warming. Not only that, okay, that's just the link to 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 flying. Australia is itself the third biggest exporter of um, carbon emissions producing fossil fuels in the world. This tiny country of 25 million people, it's really almost negligible in the global population, but only after Russia and Saudi Arabia actually produces coal and gas on a scale that that causes um, that leads to carbon emissions that cause climate change. So, so this story is getting kind of weird now. Um, what am I saying with these various links? Well, firstly, I'm saying that Boeing is a problem. Okay, Boeing, Boeing did stuff that killed people, and they and they knew they were creating that risk of killing people. But I'm also saying that they didn't just do that because they're bastards. They did it because that was the game. That was the, that was the system. That is the system of capitalism in which they function. They, that, that, the, that 
airline safety had been deregulated for them. They had been prioritized in, in, in this global competition between um, um, Boeing and Airbus. They, had, they existed in an economic system which, which said to them, your business manager should run your company, not your engineers. Your responsibility is to your shareholders, not to the public. Um, they simply existed in that, that, that system that already defined the terms and conditions for them. The fact that they um, simply made what inside that system are purely rational decisions is an entirely another matter. Um, but I'm saying something else at the same time. I'm saying that it's not just the, 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 the managers at Boeing that are responsible, that there's a kind of destructiveness that is not just the killing of 346 people in the third world. There's a kind of destructiveness that is putting life at risk on earth. There's a kind of destructiveness that is putting firstly, immediately vulnerable people in developing countries. And secondly, literally everyone in the world, not only humans, but other, uh, but other creatures at risk because of the connection between flying um, and climate change because of this fossil fuel connection that is so incredibly important. Um, and at this point, you see, we get to what I'm really interested in. Because when we study violence, the reason we focus on studying aggressive acts um, is really because we want to know who to blame stuff on. We want to know who, who can be who could be held responsible? Who can be punished for this? Who can we say, oh, well, those are the bad guys. Those are the people who we should criminalize. Those are the people we should in, put in jail. And the particular kind of work that is done by that, particular kind of, 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 of construction as of some people as being bad, has of course the opposite effect. Um, the opposing side of that is that it makes everyone else feel okay. That we are not we are not the the managers of Boeing. We're not Boeing CEO. We wouldn't have taken that decision. Um, we are not responsible for these accidents. But my argument here is actually maybe maybe we are. And that's really where I'm going with this. That's really what I'm worried about. That maybe we can't just be happy that Boeing fired its CEO, which they did after this, that he became a, a PR liability. So they gave him a $20 million um, uh, handout and told him to go on his way. Um, the problem is that, 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 that he simply did what was rational in that system. Uh, it blew up in his face, but you know that happens. He didn't. He, he's, he's still got his twenty million dollars retirement package. The problem here is that we are, in fact, all implicated. The problem is that when you get on a Boeing, you are really supporting uh, the global system, military corporate system, that you're really handing over money to to people who build machines to kill people with impunity, people who give weapons to people to attack vulnerable groups, involve, uh, um, invade countries and overthrow their leaders because those countries are not the big political, powerful political players in the world. Um, the people who um, use those weapons against minorities in their own countries. Um, that's, what you give, that, that's what you're participating in. But, it's worse than that. It's not just when you get on a Boeing, you've got a choice between Boeing and Airbus. Airbus, of course, are only the seventh biggest arms manufacturer in the world. So maybe that makes you feel relieved. But the key issue that I'm addressing here is that both of them, not only, you know, Airbus may not take the, the immediate dangerous design decisions that Boeing did, but they are both they 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 are equally involved in the, the global arms industry. But that's not the issue. Even it's not just the millions of people that get killed because of that. It's that they're both involved in a, a system of climate change. That they're both involved with the industry that more than any other massively contributes to um, 
climate change because of what is essentially unnecessary social practices that because because it's nice to get on a plane to go on holiday because until covered we thought that you couldn't have a business meeting without flying people across the world or across the country um, and it only took this strange little pandemic to 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 alert people to the fact you can do that from home um, but we but, but the choice was made not to the choice is made not to the choice is made to allow a a structurally violent system a, 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 a structurally violent system of of um of the production and sale of weapons a structurally violent system of making unsafe vehicles a structurally violent system of of jeopardizing the global ecosystem through um global warming and this is really what I'm worried about that 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 these 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 things which had been called accidents um, are in no sense accidental. They are systemic, and the system is not just uh, um, the the risky decisions made by corporate managers. Nor is it simply the the, the catastrophic outcomes of a of the system of 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 neoliberal capitalism. It's in fact also linked to the global system of fossil fuel production and the technologies that we perceive our lives to be dependent on and the way in which those are in fact systems that put in jeopardy not just in the first instance the lives of vulnerable people which they do but also the very viability of what we understand to be life itself and that's a very, very different way of trying to think about violence from the way we've thought about it up till now.